I hope I, wait, are you seeing the slide deck there? Dan? Mm -hmm. Right, it's not changing. How come it didn't change? Hmm. Hey everybody, welcome. You're uh, here at EdTech Team Live. We are super excited to be joined by two authors uh, this evening, this morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, hopefully you're in the back channel of YouTube right now. Um, and go ahead and let us know where you are watching us from today. Um, and feel free to share your Twitter. Um, we're joined by Dan Ryder and Amy Berval, um, authors of um, intention, cre critical creativity in the classroom. Uh, and they are going to walk you through some really exciting activities all from the book tonight. We're gonna give away some books uh, and hopefully we're going to um, connect with each other and, and learn about how to implement this in the classroom. Dan and Amy are so awesome and uh, having them in your network will be um, a great addition to your practice. But check it out in the chat, everyone. We've got Susie looks like from New Zealand. Barb, Barb has, I think, been to at least 20 of our webinars. So Barb is the best. <laughs> wow, Barb. Yeah, Barb is a rock star. Fiona, um, Holly is here. Thanks, Holly, for coming. Yay, hey, Tracy, welcome from California. Uh, throw in your Twitter handles in there, everyone, and, and make some connections, multitask today on our um, EdTech Team Live uh, author chat. Welcome from Virginia, Penny. Excellent. Um, well, I'm here to hand over to Miss Amy and Dan, but just a few things about EdTech Team and EdTech Team Press. Um, you can follow us at EdTech Team. We have webinars all the time for uh, the community. Um, hashtag EdTech Team if anything uh, jumps out to you tonight or today during the webinar. Uh, this archive will be available uh, on this very YouTube page. So please uh, feel free to send it out after, during, uh, and help get your colleagues uh, getting critically creative in the classroom. Uh, so I, without further ado, I will hand off to Amy, um, who will dive us right into some of our creative activities. Hey, Amy, how's it going? Hey, it's going great. I'm here in Hawaii. Hopefully the cat doesn't interrupt us, but you know, serendipity and all that so <laughs> does your cat have a twitter handle i feel like your no. cat <laughs> nor an instagram <laughs> <laughs> go straight to the uh, opening slide deck then or the opening slide and then dan where are you joining us from tonight dan's going to be hanging on the back channel with us where are you at tonight i am in the glorious metropolis that is north j maine <laughs> as far so. as from hawaii as you can get right yes <laughs> in, in the u.s <laughs> Is there a nonstop Honolulu to Portland, Maine flight? No. We have discovered there is not. <laughs> <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so we're ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, let's see. I can do this. Going into everything. So if you are joining us and if you're on Twitter, please um, feel free to follow me or Dan, he's Wicked Decent, or Intention Book, which is of course the book. We also have a slow Twitter chat going on with the hashtag Intention the Book Chat. And some of our readers have been taking over that and doing really creative things. And of course you can always tag Intention the Book or Critical Creativity as well. So we're going to have a few little giveaways today. I know EdTech team is going to give away some books to the people in the webinar, but we also have a Twitter uh, chance on Twitter. And so if you have intention already, if you've been reading it, please feel free to share a selfie and have a chance to win swag, which could be this giant lovely poster in hot pink or some stickers. And if you would like a copy of intention, um, we're going to put out this 
this contest to tweet a creative plea and be entered to win. And you can see some of the people. This, this gentleman, Paul, actually matched his wardrobe to our book, which I thought was pretty creative. And of course, this adorable little cutie that <laughs> is reading ahead. Um, just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Meg Willig, who is a wonderful artist, did these for us, in, and we include them in Intention the Book. But they're kind of an infographic, I guess, of, of you know, various aspects of our personality or whatever. And I've been a classroom teacher for 22 years, ending up with the International Baccalaureate and also have done a numer just numerous things revolving around creativity, my own artwork, but also writing curriculum based on creativity and doing voiceovers and, and all kinds of art. So that's me, uh, beta testing apps and all kinds of fun things. And I'm gonna give this one over to Dan. Oh, I'm in two different places at once. <laughs> oh, there I am. There's my glorious dome piece. Um, yeah. I. Uh, Fancy myself an educator, a design thinker, and a improviser uh, from the glorious foothills of Western Maine. And uh, I've been teaching at that same high school now for almost 20 years. Uh, I was an English teacher for 19 of those. I'm a newly appointed education director of our new Success and Innovation Center. So I'm super excited yeah. about next week and what new things may come uh, as a result of that. Can't wait to hear your tweets on that one. Well, Dan and I met uh, at South by Southwest Edu a couple of years ago. I'm sure some of you go there and it's just fabulous. But we immediately had this connection um, and we decided to just be playful really on Twitter and do a little project with each other called Hashtagery because Dan is the king of whimsical hashtags that add so much context to things. And so he'd throw me a hashtag and I would sketch it because that's what I do is it's sort of metaphorical iconography and we had that going on for a while and then we said let's do something with our students because Hawaii is pretty much the farthest place you can get from Maine in the contiguous US well not even in the contiguous US in the US so we did a project together called Remash which involved students exchanging poetry and visualizing that and and all of our students were quite impressed with this collaborative creativity that went on across the continent and then we decided, I think we have enough things to share with people that we should maybe combine our, our resources and create a book. And we are strong believers in creativity. And these are the reasons why. So this first part of the webinar is gonna be a little bit about theory and the second part, very practical. We're gonna end with things you can do right in the classroom the first week or month of school. And we have a little contest around that. So why creativity? Notice, by the way, I'm going to flip this back, that I have a scientist, because often people think of artists, right? The first thing when they hear creativity, they think of artists. But I want to stress that all disciplines have aspects of creativity to them. So I always feel that scientists in particular are some of the most creative people I know. But one of the reasons it's so important and so stressed in, um, in schools aside from the fact that it's been kind of neglected for a while, um, is that it's impossible to see the future this, with this exponentially changing world. So the only thing that we can hope for really is that we foster a love of learning in our students, a curiosity and an agility of mind, an ability to kind of go with the flow and remix things and see new challenges and take on new challenges and take risks. So that is the key really. And in the book, we, st we start really with a credo of what we believe about creativity because there's a lot of misconceptions about creativity. And these are just some of the things that we believe, some of the things we included. Uh, the first one is creativity is a Tao, which is, means the way, right, in Chinese. And, and that really is true. It's not a thing. It's more of a way of looking at the world, a way of being, a way of acting. John Cleese, the famous uh, Monty Python uh, comedian said, you know, it's not a talent. A lot of times people think, oh, I'm not creative because I'm not talented artistically. But no, it's really this kind of curiosity and sense of wonder and a way you operate in the world. I love this quote from Ray Bradbury about stuffing your eyes with wonder. And I've been known to like be really annoying to people when I walk down you know, the street in a city and I take a picture every two seconds because <laughs> I'm full of wonder. Somebody that might see the world like this, 
see interesting things in the mundane, see patterns that no one else sees. We also believe uh, creativity is a birthright, that everyone is creative. That It's not like some people are born more creative than others. They might be born more talented, sure. But we, in this, we do believe that you can train the creative brain through practice and through understanding what creativity is and how it works, and also through creative strategies, which we hope to offer in the, in the book. When people ask me uh, to talk about creativity, and there's this kind of definition going around, uh, and I think Ken Robinson even talks about it, that, that it's about creating something novel that's useful. And that's really, for me, that's innovation. Creativity, for me, is the connecting of dots. And that's actually what Steve Jobs believed as well. But what's really important to understand is that in order to connect dots, you have to have a wealth of dots to connect. And the dots are kind of metaphorical for the bits of knowledge and experience that we accumulate over time through learning, through you know, learning through people or at school or on our own, and also, of course, through our own curation on a day-to-day -day basis and our experiences. And that is why teachers are so important because we help students grow their dot forest. And this is why we stress in the book that creativity is not just like all about inquiry-based learning and discovery and making and all that good stuff that we love. It's also a balance of direct instruction. And that's why teachers are so important, that we need to guide the students' learning and that content is, is extremely important. We shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because we want to be more creative in our classroom. And I have a little anecdote for that. It's, I, I was watching Tom York of Radiohead um, dance, his funky little dance in Lotus Flower, and es immediately I just thought of Egon Schiele, the famous artist. And I thought, wow, it's exactly like that. And I wouldn't have known that if my art teacher in high school hadn't first turned me on to Egon Schiele, introduced me to him, but also made the learning sticky enough that I would remember Egon Schiele's work in the back of my head for you know 30 some odd years and then reference this when I watched Tom York. We also believe that creativity has lineage, that it's about remix, that everything is a remix really. And a lot of people think creativity means something new, but in our perspective, everything builds on each other. Um, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So creativity is derivative. And the important part about that is that students should be articulating the lineage of their creation. They should be explaining what influenced them to make something a certain way. And also, I started thinking about learning a while ago, and I really thought that if you can actually, instead of regurgitating something like we grow up doing, um, if you can remix it, if you can give new context, new insight to it, if you can really transform something to give it a new meaning, that's the ultimate demonstration of learning. To me, that's what learning is. And it reminds me of a skateboarder. Um, a skateboarder learns established tricks, like an ollie. But they'll learn, and then they'll riff on it, and they'll experiment, and they'll create something new. And that, in itself, to me, is real learning. It's also very intrinsic. That's why I love to use skateboarders as models for learning. Creativity thrives on context. And what we mean by this is that it's very important to have a community, to actually grow a community in your classroom that enables risk-taking, that fosters trust and respect among students and teachers, that has all the tools needed and the environment really cultivated so that students can feel comfortable. So we call this time, tools, and trust. I think one of the most important things is really trust because then you'll be able to take a risk. But devoting time to it and also having tools, not just digital tools, but anything from index cards to Play-Doh to you know, a, a MacBook to Google Suite. I mean, all those tools will foster creativity. So we like to think of this as um, the space as a muse. So think of your classroom as a muse. And this term mise en scène really means kind of setting the stage, setting the place up for good things to happen. So designing experiences 
um, which can which can be remixed and, and interpreted differently by students, but offering them the resources. And that's kind of what our book became, is kind of a set of experiential design with suggested resources that you can use and remix in your classroom. And I also wanted to make this, we're, Dan and I are both very um, connected educators. We were online all the time. I make a lot of digital art in particular, but we really truly believe that using analog materials and analog methods mixed with digital or on their own is so important. And Paul Rand, one of my favorite um, kind of graphic artists from the 50s and 60s, said this about, about using your hands. And I never, I wasn't really sure about this until the first day of school with my seniors. Okay, so they're 17 years old, right? I had Play-Doh on the desk for them to create a stop motion animation film. The very first day of school, no syllabus, we're just going to make the stop motion that has to do with our course. And they loved it. I mean, just this, this tactile experience made the learning so much more real for them. And finally, in our credo, this is probably one of my favorite bits because it really is what our book is about. Creativity craves constraints. So a lot of people think creativity is all about freedom. And the more free you can be, the better it is. But really, that makes things quite difficult. Um, people flail around, they don't know where to start. Vince Van Gogh had a saying like, if you're staring at a blank canvas, just slap something on it, you know, just get started. But what really helps students is if they can have parameters, if they can have some something to play with, and then the creativity really blossoms. So I always say the way out of the box, meaning, you know, getting out of the box, is via the shackles, really. Um, Brian Mathers, who's from, Eng or he's from Ireland, actually, um, he's from the UK, and He's a wonderful artist, and we asked him to review our book, and he did the, the most wonderful thing, which was to sketch note our book, I mean, to draw these amazing visual things that he calls visual thinkery. And one of the quotes that really impressed him was this by G.W. Chesterton, which is the most beautiful part of every picture is the frame. And that's kind of what we mean by the creative constraints. So getting to that, the book, Although we say that creativity is critical, we've come up with this term called critical creativity, which is kind of a marriage of critical thinking and creative thinking and design, really. And you'll see this hashtag in our funky little unicorn. I'm going to explain him later. His name is Proofrock from T.S. Eliot's poem. Uh, but this concept of rigorous whimsy, it'll pop up a little bit later. So what is critical creativity, we define it in the book as this, students using creative expression to demonstrate deeper thinking and the nuances of understanding content. I love the word nuance because that really to me is a powerful word. Um, it's very nuanced. <laughs> no, but I, I really think that getting students to really get past the, the obvious and get to the nuances is so important. So how do they do that? Well, Dan, truly believes, and I love this, this kind of tagline that he made up, if they build it, they will get it. They build it, they will get it. And here's two of his students building something. What were they building, Dan? I'm chiming into Dan. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I was on mute because I heard some sorry. dirt slamming in the background. And what I were they want... building here? Uh, OK, so this is our Oreo challenge. Uh, oh. This was the second or third day of humanities class, mm -hmm. and they were tasked with uh, 20 minutes to design an ad that demonstrated to next year's humanities class just exactly what humanities seemed to be about. And so that's what they're they're doing there. And they had uh, they had 20 minutes to make it uh, make a a, a uh, two dimensional visual ad. So it could be either either print. Uh, you know, like a, like a static image or it could be a moving image. Great. And you did that in the first month of school, right? So that's yeah, we did, kind of we did that in the first week. We did that in the first week. Wonderful. And we, I don't mention Oreos later, but if, if anyone has seen our tweets, the Oreo challenge is always a really popular one um, because the Oreo is just like the perfect medium. It's black, it's white, it's creamy, it's crunchy. You can destroy it. You can bite it. You can half it. You can do whatever. So it really offers the, this perfect creative constraint to demonstrate um, something visual, to demonstrate a visual idea. And if you look up Oreo challenge or if you look up 
intention Oreo on Twitter, you'll see all kinds of examples. And we have some in the book as well. Adults like to do this too, by the way, in pro D or PD. Yes, um, they do. <laughs> they, they love it. Um, I love this quote from E.E. E. Cummings about uh, kind of how we know things. So we, we usually know things by, you know, getting told something or reading about it or learning about it at school. It really means all those things were kind of a hodgepodge of other people. But the moment we actually participate in the making or doing of something, we feel it. And that is when we internalize it and it becomes part of us. It becomes very authentic. So I think it's a good thing to remember um, to balance those two kinds of learning. And I also love this quote by Van Gogh. Here's one of my sketches that appears in the book. I kind of based them off of Greek pottery, black figure um, pottery. Um, but Van Gogh, it's looking at things for a long time that ripens you and gives you a deeper meaning. And that's why we call the book Intention, is because we want students to really think about something and understand their intention behind their creative choices and articulate that intention, to be intentional about their making. So as teachers, I know for Dan and myself, our goal is we want learning to be sticky and meaningful and authentic. Um, all those three things, not just sticky. And we come from a background of, you know, admiring constructivism, which is, you know, inquiry-based learning through inquiry and questioning, and also learning through making constructionism, Seymour Pair and all that, and then connectivism, George Siemens, um, about meaning through networks. How do we learn from our networks, whether they be physical networks of the people we're working with in the classroom or our networks online? How can we learn? through networks. And I love this. Uh, if you don't follow Burkhan, he's an amazing person to follow on Twitter. Um, I often get inspired from him. But this really says it all to me. Like, if, if you want epic work, it means you need to make this deep connection uh, to who you are as a person and understand that and then find a medium, whatever you like, to express it to others as part of communication, which is so imperative. And it's a, a lot of. Um, it's popping up a lot in the core competencies in different curricula. So we stress the process over product because Dan definitely comes from a design thinking background and I come from sort of a, an art background. The process to us is much more important than the final product and the intention behind the process. And more so than how somebody reacts to whatever you've made, we want students to really be thoughtful in their reflection and poignant in their reflections. And that's why it's all about this sort of metacognitive thing. I, I was at MoMA Museum in San Francisco last year and I, I was fascinated by this thing. It's like the backstory behind the painting. So you're not just looking at the painting, at the finished product, you're hearing about the dream that inspired it. And it was really cool because you could use your phone. But that's kind of what we'd want students to do with their work. And of course, a lot of the book extols play in this playful kind of um, sentiment it, to have in your classroom and to cultivate in your classroom. But play does not necessarily have to equal frivolity. Um, it can, but it doesn't have to. And we value play for the following reasons. Maslow said all creativity involves purposeful play. And I think purposeful is this great qualifier here. Play makes us flexible thinkers. Um, I know like recently I've had a writer's block, I've had a project and I've, I've been doing cut up pro poetry where I've had all these words on my table, mixing and mashing them up in different ways. And it's really helped me focus and think. And, and even though it's playful and it seems frivolous, it really gets me out of that certain mode of thinking and gets me into a more divergent way of thinking. If you've ever played a game, you know there's purpose and mastery. There's, there's some bonding going on. You have to be tolerant with other people you're playing with. You establish trust. And of course, sometimes you have to come up with new things. You have to adapt and, and be innovative and creative. So all these things, I think, are so important to help our students cultivate. It play grows our amygdala, which is that emotional center of the brain. And it really does increase interpersonal skills. It's linked to trust, which is so important. And, and yet, 
It also helps the prefrontal cortex growth, which makes us better decision makers and critical thinkers. So it kind of does it all. What we learn from making is not just, you know, how to make something, but how to problem solve, how to troubleshoot, how to have confidence and resilience and focus, and sometimes how to collaborate with other people, of course. And then with design, and Dan can go on about this a little bit um, in the next slide, but it's really tapping into that empathy to understand another person's perspective, which I think we want all our little humans <laughs> to be able to do by the time they leave school, if not earlier. Um, and then there's all these other good things, you know, finding a need, um, being aware of that need, um, being brave enough to do something for that, having creative confidence, being able to fail up instead of just be demoralized by failure. And then, of course, to be able to reflect on something and, and um, iterate based on feedback. So Dan, what, what can you say about empathy really quick? About You do a lot of design thinking in your class. Um, right. So how does empathy fit into that with your English students? Yeah, so I, I don't just do a lot of design thinking in my class. Design <laughs> thinking is like the lens through which I teach. Yes. Like that's my pedagogical lens is how I like to, to frame it because it's a mindset, it's a posture. And it's thinking always um, in terms of problem solving and user centered and thinking about how, how might we frame the work that we're doing to, under, to understand this content or to demonstrate these standards. How might we reframe that into the shape of a problem, especially into the shape of a problem where there's someone who needs that solution. Um, and that requires some creativity uh, just in framing. Uh, it's a great exercise to think, all right, we need to know this concept about science. Who needs to know this? Why do they need to know it? And let's think of all the different types of users that we might encounter with that. And you know, lots of people have seen raft activities before, you know, role, role play and, um, uh, and, and that kind of framework. But you can, you can start taking that to like this, this next level um, where you're always kind of thinking in that, in that framework whenever you encounter new content and not just for this activity. You know, right. that's, that's the key. And, and the beautiful thing when you start to embrace um, design thinking or design, or just when you start embracing empathy more fully into your, into your classroom practice, it opens up so many doors for really authentic conversations. And the piece that is the most beautiful for me is the number of times my students say, why are we doing this? Or what's the point? Um, mm -hmm. Drops dramatically. So even when we're doing something that seems ridiculous, like the Oreo challenge, or we're creating these like color palettes, or building these these um, song and landscapes and these sonic landscapes, they're already at that level of okay. I know this is going towards solving a problem. I'm I'm at buy-in, like one step further than I would have been before. I love that the buy-in part. Thanks, Dan. And, and this is just something I, I kind of uh, pieced together, but all of these things are so important. They're so much of a part of creativity and design. And, and we want students to be able to do all of these, in particular, explore perspectives to make our world a better place and, and question things. I mean, of course, right now in current events, I mean, that's the number one thing. How can we evaluate sources and question things and be someone that, that knows how to do that and make connections? I want to talk a little bit about this word whimsy because everyone seems to love rigorous whimsy, this thing we, <laughs> we, we have so much in our book. But um, whimsy actually is an old Norse, and I'm a Viking, so like I'm Swedish, so I can, I'm trying to say this, fimma, but it, it actually comes from the old Norse to let your eyes wander and explore. And I really love that definition, that etymology of, of whimsy. I think it's gotten kind of a different connotation right now. But we decided that we needed a mascot for Rigorous Whimsy because everyone loved it. So we said to ourselves, and this is kind of a design challenge right here, well, what could be a, a visual icon that represented Rigorous Whimsy? And we came up with Proofrock, the Rigorous Whimsy Corn. Um, he wasn't always named Proofrock, but basically we thought, well, what's the most whimsical thing besides a narwhal? We thought unicorn. And then how could we show that he's having this kind of intention, that he, he actually is having some rigor? Well, we're going to make him, you know, 
point to a target and with his horn. And then our lovely um, icon designer, Taylor Kaminsky, who is actually Dan's ex-student, which I love the fact that our book has student designed or ex-student designed um, uh, visuals. She designed him and she put glasses on him. And I said, gosh, it really looks like he should be called Proofrock from T.S. Eliot's poem, which we both love. So that's Proofrock and you can get stickers and they're really cute. <laughs> but what is rigorous whimsy? Um, this is kind of how we define it really, is, is calling upon greater intentionality with creative expression, challenging students to leverage what might seem as tri something trivial, but really understand how meaningful it can be. So I wanna share a little bit about the process and then why our book is a little bit different than other books. This is Dan uh, in Maine. I flew out to Maine, not on a one-way trip, <laughs> to an Airbnb last time, actually this week, this exact week last year. And this is what our book looked like. It was just us uh, ideating on index cards, which are Dan's like favorite medium. And we figured out what we wanted it to be. Why is it different? Why is intention so different? Well, I, I have always been kind of, of the opinion, because I like to remix things, that books to me, I fear what Socrates feared, that you could not converse with the author, that once things are set in stone or on paper and bound, uh, you can't converse with author, and, and they're kind of confined, right? And of course, the internet has broken all those barriers, and you can definitely do that. But we wanted to increase the livingness of our book. So what we did was we assigned a hashtag, a unique hashtag for each activity. So every activity you'll see has one, and this is called intention one word. So Matt found this, he just kind of randomly opened the book, found this hashtag, and, um, and did the project. He did this metaphorical typography, which I love, and shared it. And we hope to grow a community through the power of hashtags, which um, someone has shared that that is the soul of the internet. So that's one way. Another way is, um, even though the book is about creativity, it's not in color, and we want you to make your mark. We want you to be medieval monk illuminators and do annotations on your own and share them with us. And of course, this is Brian Mathers, and he did all of these amazing, because he's a professional artist, but you know everybody has been sharing in their own way, whether it be annotations that don't involve any kind of doodles really, but are really helpful to us to, to see their perspective. I love this one. Or like um, Lisa here, she, she has a whole notebook. It's not even in our book. She has a separate sketch notebook that's all about intention and she shares it willingly and I, I just love that. The other thing that I, I'm so proud to say is that my mentor and hero in education, Howard Rheingold, was kind enough to write a very poignant and heartfelt um, foreword for our book. So recently, I actually animated it into a video. If you'd like to see the little video, it's about one minute. It took me like two days to make because <laughs> that's how stop motion is. Uh, you could go to bit.ly intention forward. Um, and, and hear Howard's own voice reading before words. So I'm really happy to share that. And I'm chiming in right now to sell, tell everybody on the webinar, you have got to go watch this. It is, one, it's Howard's words and they're gorgeous and they're beautiful. And Amy's images married with them is just sublime. So take the minute. It really <laughs> took her like, she says two days. I think it was seven months. <laughs> I think it really, it was like this like incredibly detailed work and you really owe it to yourself to go see it. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I hope Howard likes it too. Uh, so we have, a, this is our table of contents and basically the book is structured in, where there's three major chapters that really frame the theory. And you can actually, I encourage you to read that, and um, we worked really hard on them, but you could actually skip to the catalog of creativity, which is the latter part of the book, which um, are basically all the fab activities that you can do. So here are the three chapters, Making Meaning, uh, Chutzpah and, I mean, Chutzpah and Whimsy, sorry, <laughs> Chutzpah and Whimsy, Content and Clarity, and No Dumpster Projects. And in the No Dumpster Projects, I want to point out that uh, Dan has extensive experience in particular about assessing creativity, which is a topic on everyone's minds, it seems. And 
and aligning it to the standards um, because he teaches in a public school. I taught in an IB school. And so I think no matter where you are, I think you'll find some helpful things in there in particular about assessment. Um, so that's the first three chapters. And then we go on with the catalog and we've divided it into themes. So we've got words, playing with words, playing with sounds, playing with images, playing with stuff, and the body, which is often neglected, but great for middle schoolers, and uh, social media, especially for the high schoolers, um, but anyone really. And we, in, in each of those themes, we have about seven activities in particular. And I love the fact that it's very visual. I'm, I'm extremely drawn to that. So we had um, Taylor create these icons for everything. So you'll see that every lesson has a target, which is your basic brief overview of like what's going to happen, kind of the goal. And then the pathway, we call it a pathway rather than a lesson plan because we kind of want you to remix it. We don't want to say like, this is the only way you can do it. We want uh, everybody who's out there teaching to add their own little, um, spin on it. So it's just a suggested pathway. Um, and then we have the takeaway, which is a little bit more deep meaning, the deeper takeaway um, that maybe even goes beyond the actual discipline that you're teaching. Maybe it goes more towards life, you know. And then the application are, for each activity, we've come up with three specific examples of how you could use it in certain disciplines. So we just try to balance them, you know, oh, humanities here, humanities, PE, and the arts, or science, math, and um, health. And then, of course, the amplification. The amplification is really how do you take it to the next level? Do you want to extend the actual um, uh, activity, or do you want to maybe extend it beyond the borders of your classroom? Uh, so it's really kind of cool ideas for extension. And also, each lesson includes specific, you know, go-to icons. It shows you what theme, like that's the theme for stuff, because it's a box. Um, it tells you, the, it has little clocks for how long it should take. Every clock is 30 minutes. Um, and then, of course, the supplies. And we have a key for those. So, <laughs> I mean, I think they're pretty obvious, but we do have a key. And and of course, I mentioned this about the lesson ideas, although I want to definitely stress that all of the ideas seem to be quite content agnostic, meaning you can use them with any discipline and also any age, really. I've used these a lot with adults and they love them. I've used these with corporate kind of um, scenarios. I'm going to go to a mommy group with, with toddlers um, at the end of this month and do some of the activities. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see you know, how we can change up the pathways, as it were, of all these activities to make them work for everyone. And we want to hear how you do it. And then, of course, we have more goodies. So I mentioned the credo before, which is sort of our belief, our manifesto about creativity. But at the end, we have something called how to crush it with creativity. And these are tips. And that's what the poster shows. These are tips and explanations of how to get more creative yourself or with your students. And we have a section for mashups, so you can put your own ideas in there, um, how you would toy with the ideas and remix them. A supply closet for, for the go-to tools we recommend, including digital you know, websites and digital tools, as well as analog, and a list of recommended books. And my favorite part is this reference guide. So we have it by discipline. You can go, if, oh, I teach history. Which ones directly have... Um, ideas for me. And also supplies. I'm doing sensory map. What do I need? So I think that's really handy for teachers. I want to conclude by, by sharing, um, just briefly sharing, giving some ex examples of what you can actually do the first days of school, maybe the first week or the first few days or a month even. And we're going to call this project First Intentions because if you do try these out and tag them with First Intentions, you could win something, yay! So the first one uh, is called Potent Quotables, and this is um, from Dan's classroom, actually. This is one of his students. And of course, I'm just giving you the brief overview. I mean, the book has you know three pages on this um, and all the steps they have to do. But it looks like this, and basically it's a quote, and then they work to create this visual. But notice the intention. You don't have to read all of this, but this is the student's blog. 
and why they chose a specific image and, and the treatment of the image and the font and everything. I mean, the student goes really into detail and everything has a meaning. So I've actually done this not as a still image, but as a stop motion. I, when I taught theory of knowledge, I had a bunch of quotes the first day of school about knowledge. And the students had to think about what the quote meant and metaphorically represent that in a stop motion video. And it was great to do the first day of school because I could see how they, they thought and how they worked together and, and they were creating something. They weren't just reading a bunch of rules and the syllabi. So I think um, this is a, a powerful thing to do maybe on the first day of school and you can have the quotes posted up in the classroom afterwards, something related to your class. The second is uh, what we call Frankenword, which is our term for portmanteau, which is basically um, a mixed word, a word that combines two words, not a compound word, but an actual mixed word. This is Lewis Carroll who kind of popularized it. Um, this is an example, antisipointment. You know, how are you feeling about you know, the first day of your new job, antisipointment. <laughs> so if you can have students maybe create a brand new word for mashing up vocab terms, maybe they want to do this in relation to their summer. You just want to get to know your student, you know, um, or their expectations of the, this year at school. What are they looking forward to? What, what's the one Franken word that would describe, you know, fifth grade? Uh, this would be great, too, to do with metaphorical type, which you'll see later, to make the type look like something or even as a vlog using something like Flipgrid, having kids uh, just record their answers. The next, and I, I know I'm going kind of fast, but we do want to share enough and then have enough for questions. So iconography is a combination of haiku and iconography, but Dan, this is one of Dan's students as well, um, who did this with, I think, a, a novel they were studying, right? And they write the haiku and then they translate it into icons, which, you can actually have students design on their own using Google Draw. Yay! So yeah. create a visual high uh, If anyone's done a young adult lit, just you know, that's speak. That's a section from Lori Hall Sanderson's speak is that iconography. So you can, if you know that, you know the context of that moment, people walking the smiles, becoming mental breakdowns. Woo! I'm having like, Having an electrical storm outside. This is awesome. <laughs> that was scary, Dan. <laughs> yeah, that was great. That's just uh, the sound of your ideas, Dan, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right? They're like, Thunder! He is bringing all of the power now. <laughs> okay, so I think that would be a really great thing to do, like even to find out about more about your students that could write, you know, some kind of haiku um, about themselves, perhaps. Um, also about yourself, I don't have pictures for this, but I wanted to share, this is something I did when I had seniors um, who were on that kind of strange last year of school and they, they're half kid, half adult. I had them create a, a playlist of their life. We have this for, you know, if you're studying a, a novel character or a historical character or even, you know, it could be a chemical element, but this would be like a biographical playlist of songs, but the songs metaphorically represent certain aspects of their life. And then, they, of course, they have to explain why. And that's kind of fun, even if they play a little snippet of the song. And another thing I did with, with my seniors, uh, it's called Three of Me. It's a great first day of school, first week of school activity um, to share a photo montage, three images, each a metaphor of something about yourself. I like to do where I was, where I am, and where I'm headed, and try to get them to think more metaphorically than I'm headed to Stanford. More like, <laughs> you know, really deep into, you know, really, where are you headed? Um, so that was fun uh, in the first week of school. I love to do this. I do this at conferences all the time. It's something called imagine for like an image and a metaphor combined. So you can throw out something like, the word change or conflict or something and have students find a metaphor, uh, an image, a photograph that is a metaphor for that thing on their phone. And what's really fun, uh, I, I actually collect metaphors and I have a metaphorical wall of, of things and have students kind of tag them. But what's really fun is if you look on your own camera roll, it's great, but even more serendipitous is to look at somebody else's phone, which involves trust, but it's really fun. And if they're too squeamish about that, you can use a Google Drive folder. Simply have students put one photo into the crowdsourced doc and or folder, and they can peruse that and then label uh, the metaphor. 
it's great for, you know, like say you're studying the French Revolution, what's a metaphor? And then they look on their phones. It's really cool. Dan's, one of Dan's popular, popular um, activities is color palette. And he likes to use this color lover site, which is spelled with a U for shout out to Canadians and Aussies and Brits. Um, and it's great, colorlovers.com. You can make up a palette, a custom palette. And here's a, just a snippet of one that a student did to, from To Kill a Mockingbird, where she's um, talking about the scene and she's uh, showing the colors and she's labeling the colors and she's even showing images. And so this, here's another student thing. This palette is named Tones of Existence and she goes in to explain why. So how can you do this the first week or month of school? Oh, I love this part, sorry, memory. What color is memory? I really like her thinking. Is to design uh, either something like a theme in your discipline or perhaps if they've read a summer reading book or they could do a current event or even to introduce themselves or um, the subject area, kind of like Dan did with that Oreo challenge um, as an ad for the next students. I did this project several years ago. I started it called One Word to Frame My Day. And what I would do is I'd think of one word that's depicted my day and I'd write it in metaphorical typography. This is one that somebody did in a workshop. So metaphorical typography means you take the word and you kind of illustrate it with uh, letters that look like the meaning. You'll see this with Google. I love this one, Plague Edition, <laughs> some student did. But it's really cool to do it simple. Uh, they can do a reflection of their summer, a new vocabulary term, just pick one from the book, your name, um, a theme from the, the course. There's The possibilities are really endless, so try that out. And Qlisions. Now, there's a really cool YouTube uh, channel called 50 People, One Question. They ask 50 people one question, and it's really deep, and it's basically, you know, these everybody just answering the same question so what you can do is kind of um, appropriate this idea and you can ask your questions it could be something simple like what are you looking forward to this year but it could directly relate to your content or have some sort of deep ethical or philosophical question it's great to do the first week of school and have it for parent night also great for parents to do on parent night and show it back to the students and I love uh, simplification of ideas. So minimalist posters of a concept. This is a, an artist who did various stages of depression using just lines and different positions and widths of lines and colors, limited color palette, eating disorder, very poignant. Um, the, I call these Mondrian or Mondrianify because they're just using basic shapes like P.A. Mondrian. So have your students simplify a concept. It could even be on a post-it. I love these from my workshop, Evolution, hilarious. Um, but something very simple using basic shapes and stylized images and a limited color palette for perhaps um, a vocab term or a unit they're going to study. That would be really cool to make posters. It would really get them their appetites wet for what they're going to be studying. So I wanted to conclude by saying there's more. Um, we do have a new website and we'll be uploading um, goodies. You can actually check out some of the activities on the website. Don't forget the chat. Um, there is a Facebook group for now and we're constantly sharing new ideas there because we get them all the time. Uh, and also we're available for workshops um, and keynotes. Um, we're developing an online course coming up soon, and we have specials if you bulk order. Yay! We have specials like, you know, private webinar and all that stuff. And if you're interested in swag, because we have this sort of mod kind of cool look <laughs> with our targets, or big posters um, for the classroom, or, or buttons, or stickers, Proofrock is quite popular. Um, Intention swag is the bit.ly for that. You can order them there. Um, I had somebody order a bunch for professional development, and she was gonna give away a book as well. So that was kind of fun. So last but not least, before questions, uh, I wanna just share with you that if you try any of these things out, and yeah, please feel free to remix them in your own special way. Hashtag first intentions, and if you do that through the end of September, we'll be checking them out and you know putting them in our community. Also try to tag intention book, which is our Twitter handle. And you will be entered in a drawing for 
a copy of the book. And if you already have one, you can give one to someone else or your library. And all the swag we have, which is right now uh, buttons and stickers and posters and bookmarks and cool stuff. So I think that is the last deck. I think some, I mean, the last slide in the deck. And I think we're, we have 10 minutes for Dan and I to do some questions and, and whatnot. So take it away, Dan. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I think Dan is having some thunder. <laughs> um, but I, we did have a question that came in on registration that I'll ask okay. right now. Um, from uh, we, are, what are some of the best ways you found in the elementary classroom? And this is um, in Camdenton, Missouri. Thank you, um, Savannah. Uh, for for submitting this question, um, but what are some of the best ways you found in the elementary classroom, in particular, to mix standards with creative expression? So um, I know we have a global audience tonight who have come mm -hmm. with all sorts of different requirements they might um, be faced with as we either go back to school or, or continue it, depending on where we're at today. Uh, any any tips for folks who are just diving in and wanting to try to to connect these in their classroom? Can, I'm going uh, to take that one for now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Double Dan. Yeah. Hey, awesome. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Uh, whatever. So <laughs> I think the thunderstorm is wrecking havoc. Anyway, um, I just did uh, a workshop with uh, like last week, uh, week before, with a whole bunch of uh, elementary educators. Um, using these same techniques that we've discussed tonight, and they were super powerful. And I'm getting all kinds of. Hold on one sec. I'm getting this bad. No worries. I'm muted, Amy. Sorry, Amy. You'll have to unmute to come back. But um, go ahead, Dan. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, just I heard these really fantastic ideas for simple ways to take any of our ideas and apply them to the to the content. And the reason for that is if you liked any of the ideas you heard, it's not, in no case was it like contingent on the content being of a particular lexile, of a particular type. It's really just about, about that, um, that intentionality. What is it that you want students to be able to demonstrate, you know, and understand? Any kid can do the color palette. My, my kindergarten student, my, like I have a, a first grader, soon to be kindergartner. Uh, in my house, and he could do the color palette. Um, he's done it. Just explain, you know, he's building something out of Lego, and I go, why'd you make it out of red? And he's like, because it's fire, Dad. I'm like, well, why fire? Because it's power. Okay, see, that that makes sense, right? So it's just, the, the way to reframe it is taking that time to talk to those elementary age kids and give them that opportunity to express their thinking behind that which they're making. And that's that's really where the secret sauce is. Thanks, Dan. I'm um, sorry, I mean that was totally a non-answer answer, answer by the way. But I really liked uh, also Mrs. Acop in the chat said um, looking for ways to enhance student reflective journals. So taking existing things you may have in your classroom and journals are are such a good thing to start inserting some of these activities into. Have you guys tried much with uh, different curricular journals that might already exist in a class or any anything you can share about journaling or reflection that, that might already occur? Well, I'll just real quick so Amy can make sure she gets in here is um, uh, I have my students blog uh, weekly, um, typically uh, two times a week. And one of them is always a critical creativity prompt. And one of them is always analytical. So it provides that, you know, you can do the same thing with your journals. Give them a couple of, uh, a couple of different um, suggestions for, for responses and say, all right, one of them this week needs to be a demonstration through creative expression and the other one needs to be a demonstration through analytical thinking um, or, or something that's, that, that skews slightly more academic. Um, but when I say academic, I don't mean like it has to be like high school. I mean, it's just a little more guided directly towards checking in for that, that um, comprehension level, you know, a little lower on the Bloomsie maybe. Um, but the other piece, 
really, I, I want to see that be be creative. And then, and then you have a nice then, balance, and you balance don't keep people, keep people out, from out from doing it. Every time Amy turns on her mic, her mic. we get an echo. <laughs> so, all right, uh, that's my idea. Amy, go ahead. Then I'll turn myself off. Amy, that just means your ideas are so good they have to be said twice, Dan. That's that's what I'm gathering. It's, it's the thunder and the lightning <laughs> of outside working inside. <laughs> There you go, Amy. Sorry, I had to mute you, but I think you're back now. Am I back now? Yeah, I well, I actually, since I did teach high school, I did uh, blog portfolios as well. And one thing um, that I actually learned from Digital Storytelling 106, DS 106 online, shout out to them, was that when you post your project, whatever it might be, say a student made a video, you really need to get into like the process, the troubleshooting, the intentions behind the creative decisions, you know, why you did this and why you did that. And that blog portfolio became our um, kind of our process journal in a way. But you can do that analog as well. Um, I highly encourage journaling and and especially with with all the visual types of journaling, um, uh, combining photos and sketch notes and whatnot. I totally encourage that for every teacher. And I think just uh, you know, having that archive of work and the intention behind the work is so important that we don't just you know, make something and throw it away. I mean, and also very important to me was always to share it with a wider audience than just the people in the classroom. So whether that be with your whole school community or for me, my students share it on Twitter all the time. And it was really only when, um, you know, authors and, and other people uh, around the world chimed into their work and their thinking that they felt, yeah, this really means something. What I'm doing really is something else. And we make a big point about, about that, about amplifying your ideas in the book. I love it. Um, I'll also share from the chat, um, Dan or Amy, if you want to chime in, but Penny's asked about teacher training and, and getting them excited. Amy, you mentioned a workshop you had on there with your um, evolution metaphorical image and iconography. Uh, anything the two of you want to share about maybe Peggy who wants to get teachers motivated to try this? I see just doing it like the Oreo challenge is a good first step. Any other thoughts, you guys? Um, I like uh, Lego, uh, sorry, brick a book. We didn't want to call it Lego a book because then we'd run into all that fun problem with, uh, <laughs> with not with copyright, but you know, I uh, didn't want to brand it that. But um, brick a book is super easy if you can get your hands on any amount of uh, Lego. I've done it with, with faculty. Um, I get like a coffee cup size, you know, or like a Dixie cup, um, and I just drop a handful in. People come by, I put them on a cart. Everyone had to grab a cart, grab one. And I said, I want you to create something that represents your content area. Uh, then, uh, you know, that was one prompt. They took a picture of that. The second prompt was something like, I want you to create a construct that represents how you're feeling about this week. And they took another. And then how are you going to feel at the end of this year when your kids know so much and they're so enriched and whatever. Boom, boom, boom. And then we had a conversation about, um, what could they do in their content area, in their impact area that would use those Lego to, um, for the kids to really demonstrate that they truly understood a concept. And um, in the space of about 20 minutes, we generated about 30 ideas. What they did with them from there is completely up, up to them. Um, but that's something I did with my staff just to kick off a staff meeting one day. And uh, it, just the look on their face when they see the Lego out, like, catches them off guard and throws them into a loop. And yeah, I get the bunch of shrugs and whatever, but that's not worth my energy. I, I focus on the people who are excited and want to want to challenge themselves. Yeah, I've done several different workshops, a lot in Canada actually, because BC um, has designed a new curriculum that is based on creativity. I mean, that's one of the core competencies is creativity and communication, so it totally works. So I've kind of aligned things to that. But uh, one thing besides the Oreo that's really great is we have something called two images, one question. And this would really work in a faculty meeting, even if, if you had to share something about uh, your discipline or whatever's going on. Um, and it's basically asking people to have two metaphorical images in a slide deck, so a really short slide deck, and a powerful question, an open-ended question at the end that they then lead everybody else in a discussion. And it's really wonderful for students to do as they, you know, curate articles and they analyze them and, and how do they teach it back to the class. 
it's a low barrier entry point and yet it really stimulates deep thinking and i think that could really work with um professional development as well but another yeah, one i, I would hope- throw in there too oh. is um sorry another one would be the uh soundtracking um it's uh, having having staff create a three song soundtrack um for their for their class um to listen to you know what song would you play tomorrow that would get your kids thinking about what you're asking them to to do um low barrier to entry plays inside of their comfort zone of things they're already familiar with and it gets them realizing that creativity is not drawing like that's that that, (laughs) just understanding that creativity does not equal art uh does not equal creativity um in terms of it's not a fine art uh, necessarily, you know, we creatively think and create problem solve in so many millions of ways, um, but people don't realize that. And just to have that little wake up call and have have that rattling around for them um, can shake off a cobweb that they didn't even realize was there. Cobweb shaking. Give, that's, okay. that's what we do, Amy. Yeah, I, I have to give one shout out. So I was just with Wendy yay, at uh, Google Innovator Academy, and we did a couple of different intention activities, but one of my favorites was Tableau Repro. And Tableau, which Dan does a lot in his improv career, um, just requires people to create, uh, in a group, create a Tableau, a still kind of montage with their bodies representing the crux of something. So we did movies just because we were having fun, but it was amazing to see how people in a short amount of time came together synthesized the main idea of the film, the iconic moment, and then decided how they were going to collaborate to demonstrate that with their bodies. And um, I could see that with anything that you're studying, to be honest. Um, I think that would be a really fun thing to do. I love it. And the, and you're so right. And I think uh, something fun that Amy did for professional learning, since folks are talking about it, um, I loved how we it was just in the back as kind of a find it yourself as well. So you can really use the activities in the book to set up a station or intermix it in your back to school day. Um, but I just thought it was so fun, Amy, to see um, folks kind of wander up and just experience some of these activities as well with almost little to no prompt, which was really exciting to see um, when we start getting teachers thinking this way too, to just experience and interact with um, prompts and, and creative expression. So another another great tip. Well, guys, they are uh, a full of trick, uh, tips and tricks. Sorry. Thanks, Amy. Um, and so you'll have to just keep talking to them online because we are at the hour Um, Please grab a copy of Intention um, online, um, Intention, uh, the book dot online. Uh, And if you've read it, like I saw Dan mentioning in the chat, um, please leave a review. There's some really awesome uh, um, reflections about using this book. Um, So please head to Amazon, grab it. Um, We are going to chaffle off. Um, I just love that the power of this book um, we made up words while while on this very um, whimsinar tonight. So the power, um, especially speaking to P- Fiona, who was talking about, can we do creative exercises online? Um, and it's possible uh, for sure. So whatever environment you're in, I'm confident that there is um, an activity and strategy in this book for you. So let's chaffle, folks. Um, we've got a scientific way of doing this. Uh, we are going to scroll. And see who we stop on. And so the winner of a copy of Intention is Susie, Susie Gold. Um, we will send that over um, to you um, in New Zealand. Yay. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Amy has given you a few different ways to continue to win um, your own copy. You can get your own copy, of course, online. But please stay in touch um, uh, both on Twitter and in the community with all of these fabulous Uh, things we have going. Uh, You can also check out other EdTech Team webinars um, at EdTech Team, hashtag EdTech Team. uh, And of course, check out other books from EdTech Team Press at uh, edtechteam.press. So we will see you online. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. um, And you can watch this again and again uh, on this YouTube webinar page. So thanks, Amy. Thanks, Dan. What a great night um, sharing creativity with you. Thanks so much, Wendy. Good to see you again. And Dan. Thank you for having us. Thunder time. Thunder out. Thunder out.